Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center. I'm Shane Morris. I'm here with John Stone Street to answer your questions. All of these were sparked by Breakpoint commentaries and podcasts that we've recently aired, short courses we've held, and articles and columns we've published. And if you want to submit a question of your own, you can email us at asktheColsoncenter at colsoncenter.org. John, I have a question for you before we uh, start out today from me. To what extent do you think being a dad That's and, not having, allowed. <laughs> and having kids, no, no, I'm, I'm just going to spring this on you here because I want to know the answer. I'm My oldest is eight and I'm just moving into the territory that you're in kind of as a dad. And um, so I want to know to what extent has your experience as a dad prepared you for answering Q&A uh, questions on a podcast and then follow up. What's the craziest question your kids have ever asked you? Oh, man, you have to give me some time to think through that. <laughs> Hunter asked me a different question every day. There's too many to pull and, from. Uh, and it might be, yeah, it, it might be that, you know, he's, you know, we, we went from uh, having kind of, you know, preteens to, you know, a toddler and so, and, and from girls to a boy. So it just changes everything. What a but no, I mean, look, I, um, I, 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 look, I get asked parenting questions all the time. And I'm always like, I'm not old enough to ask this. I, <laughs> you know, be, I, I have so much grace for parents. I feel like we're just making stuff up half the time. And you want to have some really good advice. But I always say, if you want advice like that, go ask some old people. But I have been asked some pretty crazy questions. Um, so, uh, and, you know, uh, ac across the board. We're at that point, though, I tell you, that's a lot of fun is we have a lot of great theological and cultural discussions. Oh, yeah, uh, at, around the, 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 the table. Yeah, it's fun. And what the funny part is, is like, it can get really like profound, like either about mm -hmm. the election or about, you know, some of the issues of culture. And then Hunter will just weigh in with his opinion. And, uh, and usually has something to do with superheroes and Avengers and nothing to do with uh, anything else. Yeah, my son this week asked me um, a really profound theological question. He he was watching this um, nature documentary about uh, the Polynesian islands, I think, and and uh, he sees this lava flow, you know, all that viscous lava um, just coming down the hillside. And it's all glowing. It looks like you could almost pick it up and play with it. And he goes, "Would Anakin Skywalker burn in that?" And I said, yes, my son, he would most certainly burn in that. I let them watch the third Star Wars movie recently, not the not the um, original trilogy, but the prequel trilogy. But I made sure they covered their eyes during that part where, you know, Anakin gets burned. So that was his question. You know, oh. he wanted to know if that would have burned Anakin just like he did in the movie. Yeah, there you go. And it will burn you. <laughs> probably not, probably not just like it. There is a little bit of, uh, you know, yeah. some, some good, you know, fun film work happening there. Yeah, so, CGI wizardry. Sure but I'm getting the same thing you're getting too, though, John, is the move into like theological and um, not really political, but like life questions, things that they kind of have to deal with. I mean, some, some really tough stuff, like where do, you know, where do babies go when they die and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we got, you know, we, we get questions from our kids all the time and um, I hope that's preparing me in some respects to be, uh, to be an effective um, answer giver for questions that we get from our audience. And one of the questions that we continually get here is, and it's really variations on the same thing. <clears throat> and it's this question of how do we live faithful Christian lives uh, in the midst of a sexual revolution where the ground seems to be shifting beneath us and values and, um, and facts that we took for granted are no longer part of the part of the mix, and we're expected to just sort of knuckle under and uh, and accept this new way of looking at the world. And we got a couple of questions here. I want to. I'm kind of just going to summarize um, these two because the answers are going to be very similar. But we got a question from uh, this uh, this woman who's writing in, uh, asking for advice for her husband, who is actually a, a vice president of human resources at a hospital and they've got a self-funded insurance plan um, that does not cover sex reassignment surgery. But a mother has requested this surgery for her 17 year old daughter uh, who thinks she's a boy. And the insurance company actually denied the request and her husband has also denied the request. But this mother is continuing to make her case. And now she has a bunch of different doctors and psychiatrists backing her and saying that her daughter needs to transition to being uh, expressing herself as a boy and get medical intervention of some kind. And 
this woman's husband as a, as a VP of human resources at a, at a hospital is continuing to deny the request and feels he cannot in good conscience um, accept it, that it would be a dereliction of duty to, uh, to approve it and then go through with this, um, this uh, you know, grave set of changes in this young woman's life. We had another uh, person who wrote in who's actually an officer in the Air Force and an evangelical Christian who says the seeking to live faithfully in my work and life um, and, and looking back on a very difficult decision that was made uh, in that time where um, this person had to approve uh, requests for waivers for the Air Force annual fitness assessment, uh, basically accommodating or, or deciding not to accommodate uh, transgender individuals. And I think the decision made in this case was that, um, you know, the, this person would just process the, the waivers because uh, he wasn't the one making the decisions in the, in the first place. Um, that, was, that was the higher ups. But uh, he's asking, did I do the right thing? You know, did, I, um, did I compromise my values by approving these waivers on an administrative level and allowing people to uh, basically set aside the requirements for you know, pull-ups or push-ups or, or running uh, or, or whatever? in the Air Force uh, because they were transgender to accommodate that new orthodoxy. So these are two different sides of a very similar question. And I'm really curious to see how we can talk through this and figure out the, the different dimensions because you and I have both given advice that, you know, in some cases, Christians ought to stand up and say, no, I can't participate in this. And in other cases, there may be other ways. So John, what do we think about these two cases? Well, uh, a couple things come to mind right off the bat. The first one is, is listeners might be thinking, why do you guys answer the same question every week? And the mm -hmm. answer is, we, we get, get this question, question every, every week. week. And right. Right, we've gotten it from such a variety of people in such a, a variety of situations, from students to educators, uh, to medical professionals, uh, to HR people and, you know, in, in large companies, in this case, actually, uh, you know, HR at a hospital, to military folks. Um, and it goes back, really, it circles back to the conversations, you know, you never thought you'd have with your kids. I remember the morning after the Obergefell decision mandated same-sex marriage uh, on America, I sat down with my three daughters. They were the only three kids we had at the time, and we talked through it. And afterwards, Sarah and I were talking and thought, you know, it wasn't in our parenting plan to have a conversation uh, about same-sex marriage with our then six-year-old. Um, but as M.T. Wright once said, you don't always get to choose what you talk about, uh, uh, you know, as Christians or what you care about as Christians. And so we're getting this question literally uh, a couple times a week. I was on a... Um, a broadcast with the church just a few weeks ago and got this same or just a few days ago and I got this same question and I mentioned that I, we're hearing just almost every week from someone who's kind of facing this crisis of conscience and it goes to our kids which is if we're not having these conversations with our kids we need to because the practice that we have at home needs to be up to to snuff for the competition they're going to face in life uh, there's a there's a, a passage in one of the prophets where uh, in the Old Testament where it says, look, if you can't, you know, if, if you can't race with men, how are you going to run with the horses? Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, if you don't practice adequately here on the, on, on the questions around the dinner table and so on, uh, how, how, how is that going to happen? It just has to change what we prepare our kids for. Um, and uh, th that's something that's kind of driving the conversations that we're having around our table and that Sarah and I are talking about. And so parents are just going to have to have some of these conversations uh, with their kids as uncomfortable as it is. Uh, the, the second thing is, you know, just because we're getting so many of these questions from so many different angles, um, it's just a recalibration for the church. I mean, what's faithfulness look like? I mean, Christians in other countries and other cultures and other, in other moments have had to wrestle with, you know, where's the line? What's the line of my conscience? Um, how do I think through uh, to render to Caesar what's Caesar, to render to God what's God, and not to get those two things uh, mixed up? And, um, you know, th this is, uh, you know, we we've had you know, moments where faith and culture have collided uh, in our lifetimes, but never to this degree. 
And of course, we all felt that at the end of, uh, you know, over the last several years, accelerate. And uh, it, it feels like in, in many ways that it's accelerating um, again. Uh, I, I was asked the other day, uh, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, are people going to look back particularly at the T in the LGBTQ and say, you know, what were we thinking? You know, where we actually did harm to little children. We actually mm. harmed little boys and little girls. And, you know, or is this going to be the new normal? And I would say, um, you know, this is one of those things where we're trying to defy gravity and it's not going to end well. And there's going to be an awful lot of victims. Uh, that said, I think uh, with these two questions, there was there, there's a real difference between the situations that these two people are put in. Yeah, agreed. Um, the first one was asked really to basically pay for an unnecessary surgical procedure that would end up removing or mutilating a perfectly healthy body part mm -hmm. at an institution that is designed to help people heal. Um, this would be a surgery that is harming, not healing, uh, not just because this person is quote unquote, a Christian or somebody believes basically you're mm -hmm. looking at something where the, the medical and scientific community are completely capitulating by and large to a, uh, an ideology that has, we don't know where this is going. What we know is, is that in every situation where the mind and the body are misaligned, we try to align the mind with the body. Right. Or when physical reality and one's kind of emotional inner perspective are misaligned, we try to conform the mental perspective with what is observable, true, real, testable, and so on. Yeah. And this is exactly the opposite case. And I can't think of another case at all where we try to align the body with the mind as opposed to the mind with the body. Yeah. And for a health institution, a hospital to do this, uh, this seems to me to be a line that someone ought not cross. In the second case, it was really someone doing paperwork, uh, at, you know, processing uh, requests for exceptions to, uh, to uh, military policy and passing those requests up the chain. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the request made by someone else. I'm sure that, uh, you know, in a job like this, this particular officer, executive uh, uh, EO for a high ranking officer probably got some other wacky requests, you know, from enlisted folks, uh, and maybe from, uh, you know, uh, officers asking for exceptions, and, you know, basically looking at it going, this is crazy, but still passing it up. I, I don't find that one's morally guilty, for doing his job, unless he, you know, put a post-it note on the top of it and said, you know, this seems like a great idea or something like that, which clearly yeah. this guy didn't do. That seems to me to be a different um, thing. And, 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 you know, this same kind of third option, Shane, is what Jack Phillips has dealt with. Um, mm -hmm. Baron L. Stutzman has dealt with, which is, look, you're being asked to violate your conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, don't do that, but also don't dehumanize someone else. Someone has, you know, in this case, for example, someone making the request has every right within their job responsibility to make the request. Uh, to facilitate that request is actually to honor the responsibility that this person has, as well as the right that the requester has. So that doesn't seem to me to be a violation of conscience. Now, if this guy is the high ranking officer making the decision. Right. Now we're kind of back into the category of the first questioner. But these, I guess the thing that keeps getting me, Shane, is that these are the sorts of ethical considerations that are going to be increasingly common uh, that you and I are going to have to make and that many of our listeners are going to have. Th this isn't like, man, did you hear what happened all the way over in the other side of the country? This is mm -hmm. right in our own backyards and probably in our own job descriptions at some point in the near future. It really is. Uh, it really does put the lie to the idea we heard again and again a few years ago that this sort of thing is not going to affect you or your life. It, that it, if you could just let people live the way they want to live and accept their identity and leave them alone and stop trying to lord your morality over them or impose it on them from on high, then we would all just get along and have a great life. But it turns out when you redefine reality or aspects of the human person, 
that has effects down the road. Uh, it actually changes the way people have to do their jobs and live their lives and build their restrooms and do surgery and do paperwork and everything else that flows out of that gender distinction that's built into nature. And so if you want to deny an aspect of nature, you're going to have a big remainder at the end. And it's going to be all the people who aren't ready to go along with that and deny an aspect of nature. When you were talking about um, you know, this issue of trying to bring the physical reality into conformity with the, with the um, felt uh, identity. I was reminded again of Douglas Murray's The Madness of Crowds. His chapter on the transgender movement is just called trans. It's the best thing I've ever read on the subject uh, because he is writing from the perspective of someone who self-identifies as gay. He's in the LGBT movement, right? But he's also extremely critical of it and careful uh, he has a great deal of misgivings about the claims that are being made, particularly when it comes to the T. And he says, look, I'm not trying to um, I'm not trying to deny the experience of anyone who has gender dysphoric and believes that they were born in the wrong body or whatever, or feels that way and hasn't made peace with it. What I am saying is that we don't know anything about it scientifically at this point. And to be cutting people's body parts off and demanding that everyone else go along with it as if it's legitimate, necessary medical practice is idiotic and crazy and there will come a time in the not too distant future he says when people are going to look back on this and go what on earth were they thinking it's going to be the it, they're going to look back on it with the same uh revulsion and confusion with which we look back on practices like bloodletting that just make no medical sense and ended up harming people Except in this case, we know the physical facts. We know the medical facts that bodies are meant to work in a certain way and that cutting out healthy tissue doesn't cure any physical ailment. Um, it's pure ideology asserting itself over the medical profession in, in the first case and the military uh, in the second case. I agree with your assessment as well that we're looking at two different things here. We're looking at someone who actually has a causal um, determining uh, influence over the situation, which is the person who you know has to decide whether to the, the the VP of HR who has to decide whether to pay for a surgery, and someone who's just literally doing paperwork um, uh, for decisions that are made by someone else. I don't see a moral obligation in the in the second case with the Air Force um, f to actually resist. Now, I, I do recognize that at some point you do get into that category of. Um, you know, remember the Nuremberg trials where uh, where the allies were saying we're, we're, we're trying the Nazi officials and saying, uh, why did you do this? And they said their defense was I was just following orders. You know, I'm just doing what I was told. At some point, that defense does wear out. And I think it's precisely at the point where you're making uh, determinations that hurt people. Um, in this case, I don't see that that's that there's a determination being made. Definitely, though, in the first case where I mean, look, if. This to me is unquestionably a moment where a Christian has to take a, take a stand. And I, I say, well done for taking that stand, for refusing to approve those surgeries. Um, even though you're an administrative official in a hospital, you're keeping the Hippocratic oath better than the people who, who are pushing for the surgery. You know, um, there's something, and there's something kind of Kantian about this, that uh, you, you should be doing what you want everyone else to do what would be right for everyone else to do and what would make a better world if everyone else did it. And ultimately the people who are going to break the spiral of silence on this mutilation and malpractice are going to be uh, uh, doctors and medical officials who just put their foot down and say, no, I'm not going to do it. And that may cost them jobs and God bless them for being willing to make that stand because that could save lives in the end. So, yeah. And I, I think that brings up kind of, just to give people, because I'm sure we're going to get another email about this next week, right? I mean, we're getting so many. So three things to keep in mind, okay? Three things to keep in mind. Number one is a theology of being fired. Uh, look, it, 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 it's not something we've really had to prioritize, but it is something that almost every generation of Christians throughout the history of the church has had to prioritize. And Jesus told parables about it, and that is counting the, the, the cost. I, I've been calling it for a couple of years, a theology of getting fired. 
Um, and, um, you, you know, and part of that is trusting the Lord with our livelihood, you know, and all of that. And part of that too, is for pastors and for churches to get, to have a theology of somebody else being fired in their midst. In other words, like the early church surrounded the families of those who lost their lives or lost their, you know, freedoms, uh, we need to be prepared to do the same thing. We need to surround the Jack Phillips and the Baron L. Stutzmans and the, the VP of human resources at a hospital like this guy. Uh, that, that's the, we, we need to have that theology of getting fired. We need to think about it personally. We need to think about it collectively. Mm-hmm. The second thing is what, what, what we call the Daniel option. And Daniel and Shevret Meshach and Abednego is evidence of somebody brought into a pagan land, forced to violate their conscience. Given a really bad choice. Given a binary, right? Which is, um, you know, eat this meat or die. (laughs) And they're like, I think there's a third option. And there's not always a third option. Is there a vegetable menu? (laughs) There's not always a third option, but sometimes there is. And I think that that needs to be, uh, you know, work through. And you know what, pastor, if you're listening to this, uh, your parishioner is going to need your help to think that through. Hmm. Um, you know, far too many pastors in my mind are like, well, when they force me to perform a same-sex wedding, no way. Mm-hmm. If you get to draw a line in your vocation, your parishioner gets to draw a line in his. And we need each other to know where those lines are. Yeah. The third thing that I'll say is, in fact, I actually sent the uh, question, and hopefully this person is listening. I sent this question uh, from the VP of Human Resources at the hospital, who's actually making this decision. It feels like they're going to lose their job uh, to our friends at the Alliance Defending Freedom, hmm. and they immediately said, "Have them call me." So uh, hopefully, we've already reached out and let them know. But if you're hearing this from the first time, uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom, they're, they're looking for this. Now, some people don't, you know, uh, wh- one of the things I appreciate about ADF is that they're not winning to win. Uh, they're winning to do what's right. Uh, they're not just looking for cases that are high profile. They're looking for mm-hmm. cases that set good jurisprudence so that religious liberty is protected uh, and restored in the American context, not just kind of serving my own needs and everybody, you know, we good, that side bad. Um, and you need to keep ADF on speed dial if this is you <laughs> and some some others. So those are three things that I think can be hard, tangible steps that we take in order to, um, um, you know, evaluate situations like this. John, well, let me ask a follow-up question here. Who, if there's someone listening in our audience um, who's in one of these professions, you know, who has the biggest target painted on their backs at this point? Who needs to be getting ready right now for this question to arise in their profession? So we've got medical, um, administrative officials in the military. Who else? Educators, Educators. uh, certainly educators. Yeah. Um, And and that means two groups, right? Certainly Christians in a uh, public education setting, whether at a university or at a school. I mean, you know, basically being forced to use pronouns, which in my mind falls into the category of a lie, right? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, calling someone by a chosen name is, that that name refers to them. Calling someone a he or a her or a them refers to, you know, either a singular or plural group of people with a particular sexual identification. And so it tends to to exceed that, but you can get a lot of trouble for that. Um, you know, the Daily Citizen just got kicked off Twitter for that, uh, or not the Daily Citizen? Right. Um, um, yeah, is it the Daily Citizen? Citizen is it Citizen, Citizen Link? Daily? Citizen Link, yeah. But okay, I, yeah. I think it's called the Citizen Daily uh, okay. account. <clears throat> so it's a uh, it's a remarkable uh, thing. I, I think so. I think that's uh, that's it. But I think in some way we I think those are kind of key. Sorry. I think those would be kind of the first two kind of in line. Uh, by the way, the, it's not just educators at public institutions, it's also Christian educational heads of school, mm. whether we're talking about presidents and provosts or whether we're talking about you know, boards or you know, headmasters at schools, because um, that's gonna come back in a vengeance in a hurry. And if the Equality Act goes, it, you know, gets some traction, at any level, even a neutered down version of the Equality Act is going to cause a lot of uh, a lot of challenges there. 
So, but, but look, I, I say that Shane and think, I think we've heard from seven different seven or, I mean, we need to go back and total to the total them, but I think we've heard probably from seven or eight different professions right. on this one issue. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't have thought of some of them. Um, and that's going to be, um, you know, that that's going to be an interesting question. Hmm. You, you can't, you can't, you can't say that this lie is true. Uh, you know, at this fundamental level, a level in which so much of society depends who, who are males, who are females and pretend like, you know, what, what does my sexual beliefs have to do with you or how is this going to hurt you? It just changes everything. There's a compliance that's being forced and Douglas Murray and some of the people, you know, that are other letters in that acronym realize just how uncomfortable it is. Um, so yeah, it's a good question, Shane. I, you know, those educators and healthcare workers seem to be at the top of the list, but I don't think very many people are far behind. Mm. Yeah, because they're the ones who actually have to uh, use the pronouns and uh, use the knives and the uh, the hormones and so forth to, to bring about this false reality that we've decided um, needs to be brought about. There's but, a, I mean, think about it. You, you can think about Christian camps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, especially organizations that are evangelistic, you know, not just kind of offering a place for the church youth group to go, but also, mm -hmm. you know, kind of doing something more widely, uh, you know, um, you know, retail workers. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of, you know, my daughter who's about to, you know, work, you know, head, head into her first job, you know, probably within the next year. And, you know, what's she going to be asked to do? These are live questions. Hmm. There's another dimension to this, John, and it, we've talked about sort of the hard power side of it with uh, with government edicts like the uh, Equality Act that could come down and change the way we view discrimination in this country from a legal standpoint. But there's also the uh, soft power side of it. There's the issue of uh, corporations and what they allow. And that the way you mentioned, you know, Citizen Link there really brings that to the fore because this is a focus on the family Twitter account. It is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a mainstream group, as mainstream as, uh, as Christianity and skepticism toward the transgender uh, movement gets. That's it. And I think it was it. It was a, um, yeah, it was an issue of uh, a offense given to a, a newly appointed transgender admin administration official who uh, that that caused Twitter to take them down. And I, as far as I know, uh, the appeal was rejected, and it's still uh, it's still down. So um, this brings us into our next question here, and it's one I really liked when we got it, and I and I'd love to unpack it here because it's about this question of the public square and soft power and how we can still express ourselves and even talk when everything's being throttled this way. This person writes in, I recall in the 70s and 80s, moving from street preaching and giving out tracts in the downtown where the sidewalk was public property to trying to preach or even just hand out tracts in the shopping mall. The shopping mall seemed like a public square, but it was private property and they shut us down frequently. Very little of our lives in the USA is lived out in the public square these days. People live in isolated homes, remote from one another. The people we meet in stores, even if we talk to them, are more likely to be strangers than neighbors. Newspapers and news stations are increasingly national corporations instead of local entities. I'm not sure what the question would be other than to ask, if you would consider doing a follow-up on this topic that addresses the gradual historical move in the direction and ways we can participate in, quote unquote, the public square without dependence on corporation controlled space. Uh, they say concourse here, but I think they mean space. And the, the, the question there gets right to the root of what we're talking about. Increasingly, there is no such thing as a public square where we can express ourselves or it's been shut down by, um, by uh, laws and regulations like we're talking about. And now the same thing's happening in the private space that we've turned to uh, in the internet for, first and foremost. So what do we do in reaction to that? Yeah, what do we do is a great question, but I think it's important to understand that um, all the political conversations we've had over the last uh, 18 months, uh, all the heat around the election and uh, even the post-election uh, chaos with the, the riots at the Capitol, all the handling of the pandemic and all the ways that different people have uh, thought about that and communicated about that, 
uh, and we could, uh, you know, all the ways we're being educated, all the ways we're entertaining ourselves, all the ways we're trying to do uh, any sort of leisure activities, all of this, the, the context for all of this is exactly what this person just said. It's a very, very important reality that many people miss. Um, you know, many people miss just how dramatic a difference that the, uh, you know, th that, that's happening right now, living in what we might call the information age. And it's not just, well, let's go back here. So the shift to the industrial age from the agrarian age moved, you know, the center of life from the home or the farm to the city, to the workplace. I feel like you just pulled out your slide projector and the room went dark and you're like giving us your, the history you lesson. <laughs> but but you, we, we look back on that as if it were kind of something that happened overnight. It happened over decades and it dramatically changed every aspect of our lives and our life together, right? Mm. Uh, we're in the middle of that same shift. It's called the information age. We're going from industrial age to information age and it's slowly moving us away from even centralized uh uh, you know, locally centralized, uh, you know, places of employment or work or whatever, and making it more and more national. And we could say corporations even are becoming more and more global, not just more national. And all of this is changing things. It's changing things dramatically. And at the same time, uh, as we've said several times over the last several weeks, um, the, the, all the different uh, mountains or spheres of culture that are supposed to carry the cultural weight are getting smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner. And that includes families and local communities. Now, you do see some backlash against this, right? So one of the backlashes is the app Nextdoor. Nextdoor is this app that tries to put you in a virtual community with the people who live right next door to you. <laughs> and it's a hey, next door. I'm in next door. All they ever do is complain about whose dog is loose and, you know, pooped on whose lawn. And <laughs> I, I'm about, yeah, the, 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 it, it is one of those things that kind of bring out the, you know, the, 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 the worst in people. Yeah. Uh, but, but what it is, what is it? It's a digital replacement for what should be happening. Right. Which yeah. is kind of local community and local connection. <laughs> you can go through the same, you know, the other backlash or the other uh, corrective is something that was becoming very, very popular uh, prior to um, COVID which was these kind of new build communities that are around where you can eat, work, shop, live, you know, all together. Or, you know, businesses like local coffee shops becoming, you know, more and more, you have the convenience coffee shops, which Starbucks increasingly became, but then you also have kind of the local art artisan, art, artisan, sorry, mm -hmm. the local artisan shops, you know, where people know how to put that little heart on the top of your macchiato. <laughs> but that's really encouraging a different way, uh, even the way the stores are set up and or the, the, the restaurants are set up and so on to create community. Yeah. And I think that tells you we need it um, and people want it, even though there's so many cultural forces that are thinning that local work out. So it is a reality and, and it's impossible to understand almost anything about our lives uh, in the 21st century and our lives mm -hmm. together in the 21st century if we don't have that backdrop clearly in mind. So that's why I really appreciated the way this thing was stated. Yeah. Yeah. There's not much of a public square. The public square has become a private square. The government shut down the public square. The corporation shut down the private square. Have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is kind of where we're at. What do we do? What if it's as simple as love God and love your neighbor as yourself? <laughs> I mean, what, what if it's, you know, Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath, seek wisdom, hang out, don't hang out with fools. Both um, excellent ideas when your neighbor's dog comes and poops on your lawn. <laughs> Um, it sounds like you have a problem that we're just learning about here. Well, Shane. everyone knows that I I hate dogs, which isn't true, but everyone knows it anyway. Um, and yeah, that, that truly is the majority of the conversation on, on the next, on next door, door site. Yeah, I next. Yeah, I, I could talk about <laughs> next door, but I'm not going to. Um, it, it It's, you know, at one level, it's an interesting idea that human nature is still human nature, no matter yeah. if you're on an app or whatever. But, um, but, but I, I just wonder how much of the basics we're going to have to return to the basics mm. of getting to know each other, the basics of thick community, the basics of looking after each other. Um, you can't have those hard conversations you need to have with your neighbors about things that matter on next door. Mm. Uh, just go to next door and look at a thread, right? <laughs> you can't even have easy conversations that shouldn't be controversial without them being controversial on next door.
Yeah. But you know, when you, you can have it is if you have a longstanding relationship, if you know each other's names, if you know each other's kids, if you're asking about other things, it doesn't make mean the conversation's easy. Mm-hmm. It just means it's possible, but we're losing uh, the places and the skills and the realities where that stuff is possible. Yeah. Um, I'm a, John, I'm a big believer in the idea that uh, understanding a problem is halfway to solving the problem. And one of the things that, um, you know, conservatives are often hesitant to admit, uh, and we need to get over this hesitancy, is that just because something is done by a private entity, or just because it's part of quote unquote capitalism, doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's praiseworthy or helpful in the long run toward human flourishing. We need to recover a bigger idea of human flourishing. It doesn't mean that we have this um, the all-powerful government that comes in and tries to save us, you know, but the Bernie Sanders answer isn't the answer. But what is, is the, you know, the sort of Burkean answer of recovering the mediating institutions of the things that we've lost that have left the public square so um, denuded and our private square, so to speak, controlled by a, 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 a ever-diminishing number of global corporations like Twitter and Facebook and Google and so forth. The best thing that I can recommend um, on on this, John, is Carl Truman's new book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, just came out this year. And he talks about um, how the the amoral uh, economic influence of technology really changes the moral questions that we end up asking. So he's not saying that things like the internet or the automobile or suburbia or any of these other uh, developments are intrinsically more, you know, morally either good or bad. What he says is that they bring up new moral questions and force us to grapple uh, with our, with our, um, our, you know, our design and our, uh, our decisions in new ways. And they change the current. They change the direction of the current. They make it more difficult to have organic community. They make it a lot easier to ignore the rhythms and patterns of nature that remind us of our uh, of our vulnerability. They create the illusion that we are gods, you know, that we can zip to and fro. Uh, if we don't like a community, we can just leave it. If we don't like a church, we can leave it. And it leaves us, uh, as a result, very isolated because we just go with the flow of these technologies. The key to, um, you know, to defeating this influence and to reclaiming organic, natural, real community uh, as human beings and as Christians is not going to be to, you know, give up our cars or give up the internet, although I think we should be much more moderate with our use of, of some modern technologies. It will be to recognize their influence and then redirect it in ways that will allow us to, you know, reclaim that community. And that was something that, you um, many of our ancestors didn't have to deal with to get out the slide projector here for a minute more. Um, you know, in the in medieval times, Truman talks about how the patterns of uh, life and death of uh, seed and harvest of spring and summer, uh, fall, winter, all of those reinforced uh, in people's minds, the realization that they are vulnerable, um, that they are dependent, and that community is their means of survival. But now we have this technology which removes us from all those natural rhythms and tempts us to believe that we are um, like gods, that we are more than we really are, and that we can exist without these things. But we can't. We can't exist in a denuded public square for long. We need each other. And ultimately, um, I think it's going to begin with recognizing that fact and then getting out of what I like to call the hamster tunnels. So the the pre- uh, the preconceived, prefabricated ways that you're supposed to travel, interact with people, and um, and just live in general. So, like the, uh, you know, uh, Neo in the beginning of uh, the Matrix. You know, he's in this world of illusion that looks a whole lot like our world, and he just goes to work and comes home and watches TV, and maybe he goes to the gym, and then he and then he repeats the whole cycle again and again. He, he doesn't even go to church, of course. So. It, that rhythm, you got to disrupt it. You got to get out of that. And sort of, I'm not saying take the red pill here, but kind of take the red pill. Um, be intentional about, like you said, meeting your neighbors, about spending time with family, about choosing and prior, or at least prioritizing locality and place above um, necessarily convenience. Um, go to a church that's closer to you than, um, than the church that's a little farther that you might like better. All of this 
I have to preach to myself too, because I'm not as good of friends with my neighbors as I could be. I could probably get a, go to a church that's a little bit closer to me um, and, and, and deal with people that I might not have chosen otherwise. But all of those things are how we fight back against the influence of uh, 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 the malign influences of technologies that are not going anywhere, but they ha we have to be aware of, have to recognize. And in the end, um, if Twitter and Facebook and Google and, and all those mega corporations keep going the direction they're going, we're going to have to find a workaround. Um, we're going to have to, as Christians, find another way to get out there and talk to each other because it looks like our beliefs are quickly becoming verboten in those spaces. I, I hope we make that decision, though, not just when somebody kicks us out, right? right. I mean, I, I hope we, if we see that what we're doing in these, what did you call them, hamster tunnels? Yeah, hamster uh, tunnels. <laughs> you know, is, is bad for us, right? Um, you know, it brings out the worst of us, hmm. you know, if next, if next door is, you know, should, should have, should, should cause you to offend your neighbor, delete <laughs> next door. Right. I mean, it's, it's a little bit easier than plucking out your eye. Um, but it, it seems to be a kind of a relevant conclusion. If you, you know, if it, if it's not good for your soul, if it's actually not actually, you know, advancing the message of Christ in the public square, then stop. Um, hmm. I hope we can, you know, I hope we can make that decision, and it's not just when somebody pulls the plug on us. Yeah. I, if, um, if I can quote uh, Douglas Murray one last time, he kind of predicts that there's, uh, that there's going to become a, a, a breaking point or a, um, a, a point when we can no longer take the rule of a very small number of uh, basically de facto oligarchs in Silicon Valley and the exportation of that worldview. He oh, I, I think we're there. I yeah. mean, I don't want to preempt the, you know, I know how much you, you're quoting Douglas Murray these days more than you're quoting C.S. Lewis for the record. Oh. <laughs> but, um, but, but that's the story. I've, I've been looking for an excuse. You just gave me the excuse. I've been looking for an excuse to talk about the Reddit GameStop stock thing last <laughs> week. Um, Did that happen that, after we recorded Breakpoint this week? Because Oh, yeah. I, well, I, okay. it's been going on for a little bit, but it, 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 it just exploded. That's what that is. In other words, it, to understand what a group of Reddit, uh, you know, users, and and it's not just a small group. They added a million and a half users last week, so we went up to four million or so. And the power of that group using an app to close down six hedge funds, hmm. um, and of course themselves lose the shirt, you know, because these investors are just going to move and they're going to be fine. Um, but but the but the impulse of it wasn't just hey ooh let's jack up this stock and make some money it was let's stick it to what how did how did he put it a small group of oligarchs running the show yeah um, and that's why a lot of people are saying look you know if a hedge fund guy can get on you know CNBC or Fox Business and 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 basically predict reality and then support it to drive down a stock that he wants to short why is it any worse what this group of retail investors did. That, it's an interesting question, but it's missing the larger story of the anger and the frustration that's happening. And um, th there is a, a pushback on this. We're seeing the pushback on, on the attempts to create you know, new social media channels. I don't think those attempts are going to be largely um, successful. The problem when those things are created, because humans, we're not a culture right now that governs ourselves. So it brings out the worst in us. Those places become right. really awful. Um, and I get the, the, the push that I don't want to be censored, but I also understand that we're not the type of people that can live without, I don't want to say live without censoring because I'm not for censoring, but I, we're not the people that can live without any moderation, right? We, we, we don't, con when you don't control yourself, you have to be controlled. That's true. Yeah. Social yeah. Media. And if you think that Facebook, for instance, doesn't have, um, or shouldn't have to, uh, regulate the content on the platform, then just read about some of the stuff that the Facebook, uh, sensors have to deal with you know the people who are actually scrolling through photos and posts that get sent in oh, it's by users and you, you can see what a free-for-all wild west facebook would look like and it'd be horrifying it'd be pornographic it'd be violent and criminal so yeah that's it's a it's a real conundrum for those who are running and, the show and and the problem is is everyone well most people know that 
And they also don't, tr- they don't right. trust the, the big tech players that are making these decisions. Right. 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 Um, so, yeah. And, 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 and this is all about this wonderful comment or slash question about the, um, the ever shrinking public square, which became basically privately held and privately owned, which is also shrinking. Hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, th- this is it. I, I, th- I just think we're a lot closer to the breaking point than we, we think. I mean, you know, the story of 2020 was America's on edge. Oh my gosh. Uh, on every level, hmm. uh, America doesn't trust the powers that be Americans don't trust political authority figures. Americans don't trust, uh, 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 in, information sites, uh, news sources. Americans want echo chambers. Um, those echo chamber chambers are not being self moderated, um, and uh, we're really mad at you know other people. You know, I, I mean, I, I just thought in light of the Reddit GameStop stuff, people were talking about how it's a group of investors that are mad at the bailouts from two thousand and eight. I'm like. The average Robinhood user doesn't know enough about what happened in 2008. It's not mad at that. They're just mad. They're hmm. just frustrated. They're mad that some have and some don't. There's a framework in that. Now, some might look back at the, those bailouts and hmm. obviously fail to miss something that um, Greg Bonson said this week that, you know, when, when those bailouts happened, the trickle down bailed everybody out, right? Yeah. But, um, there's anger, there's frustration. So I think that breaking point is pretty close, honestly, which is a wonderful opportunity for the church. Right. Um, because where is our hope? Where is our confidence? What, uh, what are we trusting in? And when we, uh, you know, I, I want to send you, uh, let me just read this quote, because I was talking about this whole GameStop story with a, 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 a good friend who knows this stuff way better than me, spent years in that industry. And he quotes the fact Oswald. That you're Chambers. as on top of this as you are, John, gives me it, it encourages me greatly as to your hipness and your ability to keep up with you know what the oh. uh, younger generation is talking about. I, I I have been trying to figure out how to talk about this story worldviewishly because there's a worldview a worldview angle here. This is this is this is a uh, uh, a very interesting flashpoint story to a much larger set of cultural trends, hmm. and and there's also an interesting part too where what you know a group of reddit reddit folks uh what was it called wall street um predictions or whatever their group that could not physically have happened 10 years ago so right. being able to squeeze a short is not nothing new being able to a bunch of you know a couple million just college students being able to squeeze a short that's never happened it that took you know the internet and robin hood um uh, who, as Ben Shapiro said this week, Robin Hood became the sheriff of Nottingham overnight, which was a really <laughs> funny line. But let me just read this because it, it does reflect all of this. Um, uh, here we go. This is from Oswald Chambers. The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you don't fear God, you fear everything else. Hmm. Oswald Chambers. And I think... Um, you know, we're, we're not going to get around this, you know, you know, government, government forces, regulatory forces are a hammer looking for a nail. They have one tool in the tool bag, which is more regulation. So you're going to see the reaction to this with more regulation. In fact, you're going to see even the thing that democratized this Robin Hood add more regulation. That's not getting at the heart of the problem until, you know, the, the, uh, the sense of connection, uh, the gratitude, the, the addressing the fears, um, you know, not enough rules on the planet uh, can, and, and not enough forces on the planet can, can, can address the, the issue that's at stake re- really here. So it, I think it's a fascinating story. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring it up, even though no one asked a question about it. And I came into today's Q&A hoping someone would ask a question about it. And I'm actually hoping that what I said will spark more questions or at least some disagreement so that we can continue to fight this out. Because I think that story is, is one of those, I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously things like the, you know, the, the storming of the Capitol tells you a lot about your, the cultural moment, but it's so heated. This is one that many people can kind of look at and we can learn from. Um, 
it's 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 a fascinating story. Yeah, you're welcome for teeing that up for you, John, uh, so you could talk about your new your new favorite subject. But what you said a moment ago about the church being this being an opportunity for the church was really important and central um, because the church in many ways is like, if you think about the way God set up the world with these different Kyperian uh, institutions or spheres of sovereignty, places where, <clears throat> where his sovereignty and his work are done or are designed to be done, the church is unique among them in that it's the supernatural um, ingredient in the mix. The, the church is like the, the doctor institution, the one that exists to restore all the rest. Um, and so when you have a break in, in the family, the church is called to come in and, uh, and, and work restoration and healing and um, help there. When you have a break in the, um, in the economy or in the, 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 the uh, sphere of commerce, the church comes in there and, and assists people as well, um, gives them what they need when they can't get it through the, the other earthly means. And uh, in many cases, I think when the, when the public sphere itself breaks down, when the, the ability to actually talk to each other in a, in a productive, reasoned, and free way breaks down, the church has an opportunity there to, um, to step in and model uh, a kind of community that we've forgotten in our time, in our age of, of hyper-connectivity and rampant loneliness and anger and suspicion. Um, we've got you know, we've got the solution. And um, I think we can not just model that in the church to, in a way that brings people in, uh, you know, through the doors and into the pews, but in a way that inspires them to go back out into the other institutions and, and rebuild productive, um, free, and uh, open community in a way that is, is rapidly vanishing. So it was a great, insightful question. Thank you so much for asking that. Uh, and if you want to ask more questions, you can write us at Ask the Colson Center at colsoncenter.org. John and I would love to engage with those, and we do this uh, every week here on the podcast. So thanks so much for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. We will be back, as always, next week answering more of your questions. Uh, we'd love to engage with every single one of them, and um, you know they're getting increasingly, uh, in many ways, increasingly deep and challenging. And so I, uh, I'm enjoying it a great deal. For John Stone Street and the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris. We'll see you next time.